And welcome to the Beat the Often Path podcast. I'm your host, Ross Palmer. On this show, we showcase unusual success stories because, hey, unusual times call for unusual success stories. Today's guest is Canyon Castator, an enigma wrapped in a mystery packed in a can of Campbell's tomato soup. He is a successful independent artist, which also makes him a successful entrepreneur. His story is so inspiring because he's taken a passion and turned it into not only a thriving career for himself, but he's also built his own co-working space where he can now help bring up other artists in downtown LA as well. As you know, I'm fascinated by the intersection of the arts and business because without money, no artist can dedicate themselves fully to their craft. He has cultivated his own unique style of painting that has attracted international attention, and he routinely sells out shows and galleries wherever his work is displayed. Truly, Canyon is one of a kind, and that's why I'm so happy to be able to pick his brain on today's episode. So here's Canyon Castator. Canyon Castator, thank you for joining me on what I've been told is your first ever podcast. It is my pleasure. Glad to uh, glad for you to be my first. Very good. Well, you seems, know, I'm feeling a little safe. bit of the... Uh, the Reddit Wall Street bets energy today. So I'm betting that you're going to be uh-huh. the next Banksy and that this is going to be a remarkable thing. So five years from now, they're going to look back at this as a pivotal interview when you blow up. That's my prediction. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> then, good prediction. Before you go on a media blackout and then you stop doing interviews and nobody knows who you are anymore. Yeah. They, they won't know as soon as they know. Wait, who's Banksy? <laughs> so, you know, tell us a little bit about, you're an artist, a successful artist, uh, and a former neighbor of mine. I've always thought it's really cool what you're doing. Um, tell us about your career in a nutshell. Uh, I don't know that I'm a successful artist. I'm doing okay. But uh, yeah, I live here in Los Angeles. I, um, I run a studio practice. I've got a studio downtown. And uh, I've been there for about five and a half years I moved to LA from New York kind of like uh you know migrating west to you know for a little bit of like a gold rush cultural gold rush maybe I don't know at a kind of an interesting time and um yeah primarily I make um paintings show in New York and London and I've my next exhibition is uh is in Stockholm in Sweden, and that's going to be in August. Okay. And how many exhibitions do you do a year? I mean, pre post COVID, I know everything's different now. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually don't produce that much work. I usually do about one exhibition a year, like one solo exhibition a year. Last year, 2020, I canceled all of my shows, um, kind of really early on. I, I guess I, uh, foresaw exactly what kind of came to pass and that like everything would be postponed or canceled anyways, or like, you know, what shows did happen would open to little to no fanfare. So I, um, early, early on, I just canceled everything and, and just, you know, focused on things that I had control over, which are not filling galleries. I don't have any control over that. I don't have any control over, you know, lockdowns and, where I'd be able to travel. I felt like doing an exhibition somewhere where I couldn't physically travel seemed kind of like, I don't know. It seemed like just what's, I, I couldn't figure out what the point was. Right. Yeah. And uh, how long have you been doing this? How long have you been a professional artist? I mean, you say obviously out of modesty that you're not a successful artist, but you're doing it as your full-time profession, which I think in any artistic capacity is is winning the game regardless of let's say the net dollar amount how long have you been a professional artist well i think like if if you're an artist and you're making a living doing what you're doing or you know if you're a maker and making a living you know doing that like you're in like the top one percent of makers or artists which is you know and then it's a different story but at least you're on the ground floor of that building and uh yeah, so when I when I lived in New York, I uh, had a lot of like jobs because I wasn't making a living right. at all. Uh, I worked As at one does. museums. Yeah, I worked at museums and uh, for galleries and occasionally for artists. And I made coffee. And before that, like I, you know, worked in restaurants. And I moved to LA 
because I couldn't, uh, because it's really difficult to be poor in New York. I love like, that you chose time, LA. Like, like it's any better? Is it easier in LA? It was a lot easier when I really? when I moved here originally. Yeah, it was a lot easier. Um, but also, like, it wasn't just that I like. I mean, I just felt like I needed a lot more time in studio and not like juggling jobs and you know rushing to you know studio after like a full shift somewhere. And um, that kind of became more possible in LA. Like, you know, I moved here, my rent was cheaper. I mean, uh, you're like the only person who, only somebody from New York would go to LA to save money. That's almost unthinkable. Yeah, and I mean, it's obviously like, you know, the cost of living has increased here in LA a lot in the last like six years. I guess that is also true, yeah. Yeah, when I moved here, I had, like, you know, a bedroom with, like, you know, in an apartment with a couple other people, and it was, like, $700. So, yeah, I, it was, you know, that was, I don't know. And I also just, like, I needed a, like, New York is very distracting as well. And I think, like, uh, there's something about, like, every time that I'd come to L.A., I'd always, like, find myself doing things alone more or, like, you know, not constantly bumping into someone who's going to, you know, invite you to this thing or drag you to this thing. And, you know, I love that about New York, but it does kind of get in the way of like maintaining a, uh, a schedule and maintaining like a studio practice yeah. schedule. Yeah. And, uh, very isolated here. Pre pandemic. Yeah. It's also very isolated. Pre pandemic. I mean, I feel like artists are pretty good at being alone. Like mm-hmm. you're, kind of just like you know i'm not gonna say that i'm like good like i was like uh you know that i'm good at it but it's just like the expectation is that you spend a lot of time uh alone working in your own head and with the things that you're making and um and uh so like having all the like you know the constant excitement of new york at that time was super distracting so i found a little bit more time here a little bit more isolation and and uh and for some reason maybe this is just an anomaly with for me but it was just like less expensive and less you know i believe it was it was cheaper then yeah it's certainly gone up a lot in the last few years but i guess fucking new yorkers keep moving here (laughs) right because well i thought i mean i i moved for the weather that's the obvious answer there i moved from amsterdam for the weather i was sick of being cold and living in the rain every day and i rode my bike in the rain every single day and i was tired of it so that that's that groundhog, what, yeah, yeah, that's that why I did it. Day but where you just I, like I'm you can wake up, here. you can just wake up and you know it's going to be exactly the same as it was the day before. Yeah, and that's also like you know that kind of consistency I found like good for the studio too because I mean you you lose like months and years of your life just going into studio every day and it's just like not, at least the least it can be as nice outside while you're doing it. Yes, that's exactly how I feel. But the, I guess the interesting thing here is six years ago, you weren't quote unquote mm-hmm. making it. And then now you are. So when did, so that changed. So you're sitting in the studio more, you're working more, getting more done. How did it start going right? Um, well, I, I mean, I met a number of like super influential people, or at least, you know, important people for me while living in New York. And, um, and kept up with them after I moved and, uh, and kind of, you know, I guess like those relationships started becoming, um, more and more like foreign because I'm not seeing them every day. I'm not going to openings. I'm not doing everything. So like I would check in or like, you know, um, I would check in with people and show them what I was doing. And I guess maybe because of just like, wasn't like, I don't know, like, because I wasn't there, because, like, it was, you know, it was in sunny Los Angeles and, you know, director of the galleries in New York, and it's, like, snowing or raining. They, like, wanted to call me more or something. Maybe I was in a, like, a, maybe it was, like, an excuse to call L.A. But, yeah, I'd, I'd made a couple of, like, pretty good connections with um, with some galleries in New York before I moved here. And then over time and, like, through those conversations, uh a number of, the, I mean, like, you know, like the director of this gallery that I work with, 
postmasters would continue to check in and and we'd catch up and talk about painting and talk about this and talk about politics and uh eventually i think like in time like i kind of just realized that that relationship was going to pan out to something you know whether it was like a group exhibition or whatever like it was going to like turn into something it was going to turn into something fruitful and um but they were very like uh they're kind of like very standoffish gallery like there are a lot of galleries that like you know try to find artists like as young as possible and as you know easily to easily influenced and swayed to do this show or this show but they were like you know still very standoffish so like maybe two years after i'd moved here and probably like you know 30 conversations uh the director actually flew out to la to see what i was making wow see what i was working on um or maybe he just flew out to la to fly out to la and i just happened to be here i don't know but in my mind yeah. i like to think yeah. that he flew out he flew out just for see, you of course to see the work yeah, that's how exactly. we'll tell the story no worries You're right it sounds better that way and um and yeah like he he liked a couple of the paintings and the studio didn't like some other ones and i think like yeah like he invited me to be in this group show with uh a couple of other artists that were, you know, more established than me, but also still young. And also like, you know, I, I could see the like common thread between my work and theirs at the time. So it just seemed like a good fit. And we did that. And then we did, a. Uh, I feel like that's like kind of like the natural foot in the door. Mm. Like they give you like the test run and like a group exhibition where the, you know, the stakes are, the stakes are high, but like, you know, I feel like galleries usually are like, all right, we're going to definitely sell this artist. And because that'll cover our like, you know, expenses and whatever, we can like fuck around with this, like, you know, 24, 25 year old artist from, you know, and give them a shot and see how that goes. And once you, you know, all those things are uh, quite strategic or like, I'd like to think they're strategic. I don't know, but the work did well. Like What's the success rate? You know, what what is like a good? Are you is everybody aiming for one hundred percent of of all paintings to be sold, or is like fifty percent good? Like, what would be a satisfactory result there? Well, I think it's like really based as much as you have to like think about the work you're making as an artist. I think you also have to think about your business model, and that's not like romantic, and it doesn't sound like you know, like. Uh, yeah, it's just like an unnecessary, it's like a necessary evil. You have to think about your business model. So right. I, um, early on, I just realized that like, I wanted to focus on making, you know, 10 to 12 paintings a year, period. Like, that's it. Like, I'm not making smaller works. I'm not making like, you know, additions or anything like, you know, just making 10 works so I could really, I guess, like, control what was leaving the studio and have like the necessary time uh with each work to kind of make sure that like if it's leaving the studio it's the best that it can be and i'm i don't know so there in my business model is kind of like i have to sell mm. all the work that's, that's leaving well the i mean studio. yeah that's not a lot of margin for error at that point and what, no, what's the physical size? They're, they're t they tend to all be large. Have they always been larger paintings or is there a certain size that you're always going for? Or it varies. Yeah, like I, uh, I prefer to work on large paintings. I think like there's just like a lot more um, room to think on, on large surfaces. And also, I mean, like the, the size of them usually like relate to my body as well. And the characters also relate in scale to me. Um, so yeah, that was also, I mean, something I had to consider when I was kind of thinking up this, this, this business model. I don't know if other artists do this. I, I imagine other artists do this, but yeah, like I, I, I wanted to, to make like, you know, 10 paintings a year, large yeah. works that would, yeah. uh, attract the right people Sure. and kind of like bypass maybe the more speculative collectors that are buying very young and are trying to buy cheap. And kind of price out those people and um, and focus on you know some of the the bigger fish um, by making you know 
just a handful of large uh, large paintings each year. And yeah, so I mean, like for me, like they they kind of just had to. So they because had, when so you're making, they had to all work, sell. So you're like a hundred percent or nothing. And and did they? Did they all sell the first show? Uh, the group show, yeah, all the work sold, and then we did like an art fair. That's fantastic. And kind of like, uh, and kind of proved the rule there because like, uh, those works sh- sold, and then they um they called me. I was in New Zealand visiting my uh, stepmother's family, and I got a call like around New Year's, and they said that they wanted to do a solo show, and uh. And they gave me like a year or a year and change to prepare for that. So that was like my first show. And like, you know, for an artist, I feel like your first solo exhibition is a really big deal. Like who gives it to you, where it's at, what time of year it is. Like Like the debutante's ball. (laughs) (laughs) You're coming out. Yeah. uh... Yeah. But. uh... One chance. So all right, when when you're coming up with 12 paintings. Now, I'm assuming that you're not just saying, I'm going to literally make 12 things. Are you making, like, how many things do you have to make to whittle it down to 12? Hundreds? Uh, I mean, like, or 12. hundreds and hundreds of drawings. Hundreds um, and hundreds of drawings, okay. But I, uh, I mean, I used to ditch canvases and, like, literally scrap ideas, like, halfway through and all that. I've gotten to the point where that's not really, uh, that doesn't really happen that often anymore. But, you know, like, I... I think like, yeah, like I just worked through all these drawings, both like, um, you know, physical drawings on paper and also digital renderings of what the paintings are going to look like and work through ideas. And, you know, when you spend that much time on something, uh, you eventually get to a point where you're just like, okay with it. Mm. Like, even if you don't like love it, like, it's like, all right, this like has legs. It can live out there Mm. in the world. It like, you know, it's, it's, it's met like my needs as the artist and now it can like go and, and do its thing and, uh, and hold its own. And, um, yeah, I don't know. So, all right. So the first show it sells out. So they know that you're somebody, is this the first time that you had the idea of, okay, maybe I can actually do this. Maybe I can it was, live it was the off first, of my art. Yeah. It was the first, I, I had already like stopped working. Okay. Uh, kind of like leading up to that. I think like after like, you know, I got like a check for the, some works that sold, uh, you know, from the group show or from, I think it was a art fair in Miami. And, um, and I kind of just like, you know, made like a shitty little budget. Like this is like my studio rent. This are my, like, you know, these, this will be like, you know, my materials budget and all that. And I just try to, stretch that all the way through almost like a year okay. leading up to yeah leading wow. i mean that's how it works in in a lot of instances you like kind of dove in you went all in before yeah. you really knew whether it was going to pay because some people don't do it that way right that's interesting yeah i mean i just uh i just i had a good feeling about okay. you know when when you when your galleries can talk about your work as well as you can, because of like, you know, the number of discussions you've had with them and like that, you know, you just know that like they they can, when you step away and you know, you're in the studio, they're like talking to people on your behalf. And when they can represent you, that's like the best relationship that you can ask for. It's like, you don't have to be like, you know, going to the galas or like the holiday house events or any of this, like, you know, posh, uh, wealth criminal shit because the galleries will do that for you. Like they'll show up, they talk <laughs> about your work, they show people the work. They like, right. you know, yeah, they're like cultivating and you get to be an reclusive and mysterious. Exactly. Exactly. And, key, um, I'm sure. Well, all those things are a distraction. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, some people like that distraction. It's nice at times. Like, do you know your um, Myers Briggs personality type? You know, the E or the I. Do you know which of four letters you have? No, I don't. I'm sure it's I something. You know, it's the introvert or extrovert, right? You've got the I or the E, and then the N or the you know. 
I'm yeah. sure you've got the, you know, the introvert is the person who draws strength from being alone. The extrovert is the mm-hmm. person who draws strength from other people. I'm assuming, totally. based on what you've been telling me, that you would fall in the I column of that one. You're like, well, hey, just, I mean, just like, leave me alone. Let me do my shit. Just sell my things. I'm going to be over here painting and cut me a check. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's kind of important to be able to, like, as an artist, like, you have to be able to do both. Like, I, mm. I mean, like, I like it sometimes. Okay. So, like, you know, but, like, I ultimately... Uh, I just like value my time in the studio Mm -hmm. and you know for some people maybe it's different but for me like you know I like the holidays and like you know meeting collectors and seeing their collections and going to like events and stuff but it's just like it is exhausting it's 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 nice it's refreshing because people like you know obviously like some of those conversations go nowhere but other conversations are so enlightening and like you know, people who are truly, truly passionate about collecting and have like, you know, an insight to artists or things that like, you know, you just aren't exposed to. And uh, so like that is incredibly beneficial, but I just like value, you know, time in the studio. Yeah. And, and yeah, not trying to talk about numbers or any of that prices, discounts. Right. That's someone else. Yeah. That's someone else's job. I get that. Opinion. Yeah. I hate that stuff too. If you're a creative yeah. type, you tend to dislike that stuff. But it just um, removes the magic. Like, let, let me hold right. on to like what we <laughs> sure in a sense. Yeah. yeah. And you know, speaking of the magic, I, you know, I, you have an Instagram that's always interesting to watch. I've watched it since I first met you, so always interesting to see what you're up to. And um, I'm just curious yeah. how how would you describe your style? Because to those. Uh, it, you have a very unique, I will say that, a very interesting and a very unique style. And to anybody listening or watching this, you should definitely go check it out. It's Canyon underscore Castator on Instagram. And you should just scroll through what he's doing because I, I'm pretty sure none of you have heard or seen um, stuff like this before. How did, did What would you describe it as and how did you end up with your signature style, if you can call it that? Well, I, yeah, I mean, it's... I mean... Uh it's kind of like an anti style in a way. Uh, I don't, I think if anything, like I feel more like an organizer of images and different kinds of, uh, you know, visual languages more than a cultivator of one. Like I, like, you know, if I like something, I like earmark it and think like, how the fuck can I personalize this or utilize this in like an image? And what does this like image actually mean? And how can I like, you know, uh, kind of like mold it into, you know, a larger kind of ensemble of images and play it off of this thing. And so in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's like digitally informed collage. Like I'm just, um, taking images that I'm exposed to both naturally, uh, in like, you know, are in the real world, I guess, whatever that means. And then also like, you know, uh, taking images that I find digitally and kind of like using uh, just all these different visual languages to articulate ideas and work through like things that I'm thinking about and things that like I think are like, you know, uh, relevant and popular culture or politics. Um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, it, it's not, I, I mean, I guess I have a, a, a style in a sense, but only because I'm just working from so many different stylized uh, image types. Like I like cartoons. Sometimes I like realisms. You know, I like, um, you know, just the ability to pull from anything or if like I find myself reacting one way to an image, I like that I've created an openness in my practice to be able to incorporate that into the work. Sure. Yeah, it yeah. is very eclectic, but there is some sort of common thread. You know, I could easily, I could immediately pick out one of your things from anybody else's. I don't know what that is. I'm not yeah. sure what you would call that. I certainly don't have the language to describe it, but I would know. I mean, any, and you would easily know if somebody was ripping you off. That's the other thing. If I saw somebody who was, you know, copying your jam, that would be pretty clear. Yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess like I gravitate towards like, you know, 
bright colors and explosions and things that are quite loud. I really like, you know, um, I feel like the paintings like are loud. That's true. Which is, yeah, which I find refreshing. I think this, you know, the white, the white cube is like, uh, you know, a very quiet place and you walk into museums and they're so quiet and it can be so boring or you walk into galleries and everything is so just like dry. And, and, uh, and yeah, I just, you know, I like making loud paintings. Hmm. And did, did you, um, yeah. did you go to school for art or how did you get involved? My, um, I did not go to, uh, art school. Okay. I, um, yeah. My dad is a sculptor and a uh, and fabricator, and he was just always super supportive of like my interest in drawing and painting when I was growing up. Um, primarily, like drew and stuff, and I just like did really poorly in school, like really poorly in school. Um, and I don't know that I would have like like made it into college. Like I was like, <laughs> I like applied to some schools. And yeah. didn't get in. And then, like, I gave up applying. And um, yeah. my dad had remarried at the time. And both he and his wife kind of were just like, you know, why don't you just move to New York and, like, just, like, be there and see if, like, you know, Whoa. see if That's you can That's the make opposite this work. of how these things typically go. I love that you were encouraged. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, and Was I your dad, was really, he full-time? Like, was it a hobby or was he a full-time artist, your dad? I was a full-time artist. Okay, so you yeah. knew it was possible growing up. You saw, you're like, okay, it can happen. You had an example of one yeah. way, I guess. Yeah. Um, a little different, I think, because he's a full-time artist in Colorado. Mm. So it's like, you know, like, you know, if you're a full-time artist in New York or, like, you know, it's just like a, a more cutthroat scene in some cities. And I feel like he was just like, you know, he found a way to, to be an artist to teach art, he taught at Naropa, which is like, you know, this, uh, this school Water. started by Alan Greens or Alan right. Ginsberg, not uh, Alan <laughs> Greenspan, Alan Ginsberg and some other beatniks, uh, some beat He's guys. like whittling turquoise and. <laughs> no, no, it's not like that. No, okay. no it's, it's actually an, an amazing school. So he taught sculpture there and he just like lived this like really like nice, um, happy life making art and like uh and in in colorado and i didn't really have any exposure i hadn't been to new york ever um and i didn't really know a damn thing about the art world and i didn't really have any taste like i just like you know i grew up skateboarding and snowboarding and stuff like i like you know what i knew about art was incredibly limited and was you know anything i knew about art was because like you know, my dad would buy a book or like show me something. And like, I, I guess I retained these things, but I just didn't have any, like, I didn't like cultivate it, uh, any kind of taste or have any like ideas about it. Like I just liked drawing and, uh, I was, I was like, you know, kind of good at it. So, um, they just, I think they also just realized that like, I would have quit doing anything artistic at all. If I had gone to school, like I barely made it through high school. I actually don't have any proof that I ever graduated and I was out of town for my graduation. So <laughs> I may not have made it through high school, but, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I think like had I gone to art school, like fresh out of high school, like I probably wouldn't be making anything right now. Wow. Uh, yeah. So crazy. But you're just, always yeah, doing I, painting, drawing. I mean, that was always your medium. Yeah. I mean, I was just, I think like, primarily just drawing. I started painting okay. like in my last two years of high school, okay. just like in acrylic. Um, you know, when I moved to New York, I like, it's not like I just like learned all these things on my own. Like I started going to like uh, auditing classes at like the art students league, which is like a pretty amazing resource there. You know, you can just literally buy, like, you know, you just buy a seat in a class or mm. go and do figure drawing or like oil uh, painting lessons there. It's, it's a pretty amazing resource. I did that. I went to like the society of illustrators once or twice a week and like, you know, drew from like a live model. So I like created like, uh, kind of like this back door entrance into like understanding like certain facilities and things mm. within, within art, I guess. Yeah. But, um, sure. but more than anything, I like, was just, I don't know, like 
meeting people, talking to people, being dragged to exhibitions I wouldn't have seen or like known about and uh, just being exposed to things. I've had like, an, you know, a number of really just like amazing uh, people in my life kind of, uh, you know, help facilitate that and like help me like kind of expand the way that I was thinking about about myself and my relationship to art and then art in general and like you know you what was the studio like in the beginning days your studio was it also where you lived or did that change um I mean, you, you didn't have like a secondary space i'm assuming if you're renting a one uh, bedroom and or sharing it what was your yeah, where were you doing all this like when i when i lived in greenpoint uh in new york i had a little studio at home yeah, uh, I lived with like a handful of other people, but like I had my bedroom and then like a little studio in the back. And then um, I uh, I was there for like two or three, two years, three years, and then I moved to Chinatown uh, in the city. And uh, I did um, let's see, I was like a uh, invited to be a guest student. I had this wonderful this. This woman, Karen Wong, who was like a mentor for me, she introduced me to this artist, Tao R, who was teaching uh, in Dusseldorf at the Kunst Academy in Dusseldorf. And um, around the time that I moved to Chinatown, I met him. We did a, uh, you know, a studio visit. He hated my work, but then he invited me to like, you know, be a guest student for a semester or whatever in uh, in Dusseldorf, which is like the extent, I guess, of any like, post-secondary schooling I've, that I've done. But um, but when I came back, I got my first studio, which was like, uh, you know, 30 minute, 35, 45 minute train ride back in to Bushwick, but uh, from from Chinatown. But it was like my first studio. And then like, it's it's very different. I guess that was the first time that I'd really like been making things kind of in the vacuum alone by myself and uh and that was and that took you know that was a learning curve in itself just so much so much of that alone time that i was pra like praising earlier now that i think about it, it was awful uh, i was gonna say like you're really well suited to uh to the quarantine life you basically self-quarantined before any of this began yeah about eight hours a day but then i would have like the release like you know post studio like i want to go to the bar i like okay. want to interact and like want to shoot pool and drink and like you know just piss off right. um so but then like uh so i was there for a while and I, I moved to la kind of by accident i had a friend who needed to like do this uh program in new york we traded apartments i came and stayed at his place in la turned out that he, you know, you know, was going to stay there. He got a job in the city. So I was just like, you know what? Fuck it. I'll stay here. This is nice. Like it was the middle of like New York winter or something. Like I was just like, I'll just, I'm good. Mm. Like I, I didn't even go back to like get my stuff. I just had it shipped out. Mm. And, uh, and I lived in like, you know, that lofted spot, uh, downtown. And, um, and like I had rented one room for myself at first, and then I rented a second room in the lofts to work in for a couple months. And then I found, uh, eventually I found this building like uh, a couple blocks Fantastic. away. I didn't have a car at the time, so yeah. I needed to find something I could walk to. Okay. So I found, uh, you know, half of a floor that was uh, in a garment industry loft a couple blocks away. And the guy had never rented to anyone outside of garment industry oh, and was very skeptical oh wow very yeah. skeptical of uh of, yeah. of me as an artist i um recruited my dad who had moved here i think like six months before i did he was also looking for a studio at the same time coincidentally so he and i uh ended up getting this place in uh you know in this building downtown which was great. Um, we had never shared a studio before, but we're, we're very uh, similar in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, he's great. And um, yeah, and we, you know, we found the building. Now the building, uh, we were the only artists in there. 
And I mean, for lack of a better word, the other units are just like sweatshops and they're like, you know, 40 to 60 people per floor, just like on the grind all day sewing. And it was, uh, yeah, it was like a pretty crazy environment because like having come from like, I mean, I just never seen this before. Like, this is what that, like, this is what the actual yeah. cost of that, like made in America sticker is, is right. like, you know, just, uh, rooms full of people. Just, uh, I mean, I've never seen that in person, not the garment district. I've gone to the garment <laughs> district, but haven't gone behind yeah. the doors. It is like, uh, yeah, it's like pretty inhumane, um, Jeez. quality of, uh, work environment. Yikes. And it's really unfortunate that, uh, we live in a society, I guess that like condones that or mm -hmm. like looks the other way. And that also like creates so little, you know, access for these people that like they, unfortunately, like this is what they have to do for money. And this would be, it's, you um, know, probably far better than the equivalent, let's just say, elsewhere in the world. So as bad as that is, it gives you a taste of how bad it could be and realistically it, is in yeah. other countries. Yeah, this is like the stomachable version. Yikes. But um, but yeah, I mean, these businesses are also run by like, you know, cash grab uh, bosses that like just move in when something gets too expensive or something, you know, isn't making a profit. They just bounce. Yeah. So like, I kept noticing that like, you know, these companies would move in for like six months and then like there'd be a slow period, whatever. And then they would just vanish. Mm. So That's I started talking to, okay. yeah, that's just how it works. Um, it's all, I mean, or maybe they're being shut down by some kind of, you know, like maybe they somebody like, saying it's not okay. <laughs> yeah. Like you can't, yeah, who knows? maybe nobody knows I mean, they're doing it. Um, where yeah, are you now? Work. I mean, you're downtown LA now, right? You're what? Uh, talk to where, me about where your the studio is? Yeah, where or this isn't your studio that we're looking at now? No, this oh, is my apartment. Oh, okay. Oh, it's not. It's got that studio because you have such a loft and ceiling. It's got these high rafters. I thought it could be a kind of industrial space. Uh, looks nice, by the way. It looks sick. Um, Thanks, man. I just finished moving in. Yeah. Uh, no. Great. Fine. So, but your your yeah. studio is downtown. But you have since. So this is an interesting thing. I mean. One of the main things that I like to cover on this show is the intersection of creativity and business because everybody's got to make money. So like you said, the business side of things, you know, it's like the money side and the art side. I think that's right. what I'm most fascinated in because at the end of the day, if you're not making money, you can't really do what you love to do and you can't really get better at it. But you've taken it a step farther in these last few years. So now you, you own or you manage other spaces for other artists, if I have understood that correctly. Yeah. Uh, Which is a new... Yeah, pretty close. Something, okay. So yeah, how, pretty close. How does that um, go come about? Yes, so my dad well. and I, um, I guess, noticed that these you know businesses were at, like moving in, going under, or whatever, or they weren't paying rent and getting kicked mm -hmm. out. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so we like approached the owner of the building and to, um, to lease us a, a second floor. And we told him about our plan. We, you know, had done like uh, renderings of what the build out would look like and models and all these things. Um, so like taking other, you know, more space in this building and kind of just like seeing how it felt to like have tenants and curated tenants uh, move in and kind of just like change the space because it's a beautiful building. It's a narrow building with huge windows on both sides. Okay. and uh, amazing airflow so like we um yeah and he like was again super skeptical thinks you know that uh you know probably rightfully thinks that artists aren't very good business people um but he by that he means you know, that they're not going to pay their rent on time <laughs> or maybe yeah, or they're, they're not like, reliable exactly but you know at this point we had been like renting that studio from him for i guess like two or three years and okay. you know paid rent on time and that's kind of like all it took to gain this dude's respect it's like you know pay your rent on time and he's happy right. so we rented another floor hired contractors and did like um these semi private semi open spaces uh 
And in doing that, we were able to like kind of, instead of like creating, you know, little white cube prisons that people lock themselves in on into, like walk into and lock themselves into, um, you know, some kind of like open air community centered around this building, which I think is like really important, uh, especially for young artists. The, the majority of the artists in the building are quite young and are coming, you know, straight from straight from school into their first studios. And, and this way it's like, you know, not that like harsh sentencing of like, you know, solitary confinement, just you and your thoughts and your like yeah. crayons and shit. So, which I guess, you know, is kind of a response to how my first studio felt where I would have, you know, much preferred more of a community. Um, these designs were all also done before COVID. Right. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Let's all hang out. Exactly. Oh, that's uh, so which it, it's a little Breaks bit, my heart. Uh, yeah, it's a little different now, but, um, yeah, so just like floor by floor, we floor uh, we floor. did the exact- <laughs> It's like building a floor by floor, building by building. Now we own all Third Street. <laughs> exactly. No floor by floor. <laughs> we just, like, just, as, the as the business would a, a business would move out, we just take over the lease, um, do the exact same thing, like step and repeat. Each floor is kind of designed differently. There are definitely like some units that are more private, some units that are like a little bit more open, um, and. Uh, and it's just completely like transformed the feeling of the building. And, you know, the only people going in and out all day now are artists and, you know, people are, you know, doing these impromptu studio visits and walkthroughs and like, you know, there was more of that before coronavirus, but it's been really, uh, really amazing to kind of just like, I guess my dad and I kind of just like created this artist community around us. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just like, it's really hard to find good space as as a painter. I mean, the building is primarily painters and it's just really difficult to find like, you know, good space uh, that's like affordable. And also like, you know, so many artist studios are out in the middle of, you know, the fucking boonies, like just like, just in whatever cheap old factory, you know, and this is right downtown. You can walk to, you know, get coffee. There's a couple art supply stores that are nearby. Mm. It's like, uh, yeah. I don't know. It's it's been like a real pleasure to do as as yeah. odd as that sounds. And, it's and just like, when did when did you start that? How many years ago did that begin? That's it's about uh two and a half years old okay. now. Yeah. So things have changed dramatically for you. That's it's fascinating. I mean, a relatively short window of time. Yeah. You know, that's that's well, I mean, you're living the LA dream. Really. I mean maybe. Right? Maybe. I mean, I don't know. In what Do sense you know, aren't you? What more? What more would you want out of this that you're not getting now? What? What? Because that's a question I ask a lot of my guests. You know, are you living the dream? Yes or no? So the answer is yeah. not yet. But w- why? What? What's? What's missing from this equation? I don't know that there's anything missing. I think, like you know, as an artist, um, you know, like you just. I feel in my mind that it just you like I just remain skeptical of everything very like, you know, I kind of sit in this like realist mindset where like, you know, maybe my paintings don't, you know, uh, you know, maybe my next show doesn't do that well next year. Like maybe this thing happens with the studio and we have to move and like all these things are just like, you know, I'm, I'm very into like enjoying them at their face value. Uh, but like, you know, for me, like more just, uh, I don't know. I guess I've never really thought of that, <laughs> but it's, it's just like, uh, yeah, maybe I'm being negative. I can't tell. Well, it sounds like um, typical creative person fears, right? Doesn't, isn't that literally what every creative person thinks uh, pretty much all the time? What if they don't yeah. like what I make? What if they hate me? What if they, you know, it's, uh, yeah, true. all some variation on a theme, isn't it? Right. I can tell I mean, you that I've never had thoughts like those. Not once. Oh, yeah, never. Oh, never. dude, no way, man. I've always known with my three fans and followers that things were going to work <laughs> out just fine. <laughs> yeah, but all these things can change so quickly. Um, and that's what's so you know, cool about your story. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. well, right, for better and for worse. Yeah, it's like things can go way up or they can go way down. Yeah, I think it's good yeah. to like know like how to live when things are lean and then also like you know what to do when when you've got a little bit of a, a fat on the plate 
And uh, well, and it sounds like you've taken that opportunity, which you know I've heard. I've had a number of guests who would have advised this so far, but when you had a little bit of fat on the plate, you invested back into your thing, whether that was getting increased space or you know helping yourself get right. the tools, which you know. Come what may, it sounds to me like that's the best thing that you could be doing versus buying a new Mercedes or whatever, right? Right. And it, I mean, it's just like also, I mean, I don't make, uh, you know, the spaces that we're offering are pretty cheap. We don't make that much off of them. But the social currency mm-hmm. is the true value there. Um, so like, you know, to have... Um, I always kind of thought that this professor that invited me to do his, you know, to come and sit in on his class and participate in Dusseldorf, like he was very smart because he was basically just using his, his class as like a think tank, you know, a sounding board. Like all these kids are like in this class, like thinking up ideas and doing these paintings, blah, blah, blah. And if, if some of them were like good, all of a sudden they'd like wind up in his paintings. Right. That's the old incubator, <laughs> incubator model from Silicon Valley, if you've ever seen, right? I don't know if you've watched exactly. that show. It, I, I have, yeah. Your paintings yeah, are my paintings a, now. Your <laughs> software is my software now. But, like, alone with my own thoughts and, like, you know, whatever. Like, I'm just, like, one person. But, like, yeah. the being able to, like, have all these artists around me constantly and, like, talk to them and see their work and, like, see, like, you know, just, like, that has paid for itself. Like, you know, that was an amazing investment just in like access to you know having studio visits are fucking hard right now it's impossible but studio visits even before coronavirus were super difficult in la because like how are you going to convince someone to drive you know across town midday to come and talk to you about painting like it's like damn hard yeah um so just like yeah there's something very nice just about having you know those people around me all the time uh, and hopefully it's good for them too. I don't know. I'm sure I give that it is. Advice. Well, I mean, I you know, these types of models and... have existed for thousands of years yeah. in art and in the rest of the world. So of course totally. it's good for them, you know, just like the Michelangelo's, the Da Vinci's, they all had a stables full of other people, you know, <laughs> like you do the nose for me, you do the fingernails, <laughs> come in, I'll come yeah. in and finish it off. Right. So right. clearly it can't, well, it, you know, it's, it, it's that old thing where it'll be good for some and some of them are going to yeah. rise up and become something and some of them won't. And what are you going to do? Right? Yeah. I mean, my, um, my, uh, literally as we speak, my first studio assistant and one of the first artists to get a space in the building after we finished the very first floor renovations, she's opening, she opened a show last week week in new york and is opening a show tomorrow in uh in miami with uh her name's jess valise and that's and yeah she's opening with bill brady gallery which like you know i'm pretty sure she was introduced to him from another artist in the building this artist uh austin wiener so it's just like you know like these things are uh i think it's been like you know positive for a number of people in the building sounds like it Cool, man. Well, yeah. I wanted to get into, you know, we're, we're approaching as we get towards the end. I want to do a little bit more rapid fire questions here. Just a, a right. bit about the theme. So, so you know, brace yourself. Um, the first okay. one, what advice would you have to somebody who is considering, somebody who ever had the thought of, I could be a painter or get into the world of a professional artist? What is some advice that you would have for that person? Um, I would say if you want to go to school, go to school in Europe. Um, you know, if that might sound expensive or extravagant, whatever, but like, you know, the, some of these art schools are like comparatively like free, you know, like I, I remember paying like a hundred euro registration fee and then like, you know, to go to the Kunstigatim in Dusseldorf, like, you know, it's, it's just like they have systems, um, to make it like in, in comparison, it's, it's practically free going to art school in America is a fucking ripoff. Uh, unless you're going to RISD or Yale or RISD and then Yale, like just like, you know, if you want to be a painter, go to art school in some place where they're going to hand it to you. Uh, and you're not going to be in living in debt for the rest of your life. Well, there's uh, the also other the other thing. Other is, thing. I, I'd say, I'd say, uh, uh, work for artists. 
just message artists that you like, go and work for them, watch what they do, steal their ideas, steal their techniques, pay attention, just be like, you know, be a little klepto and just take all the things that like work for them, see what they're doing wrong, fix it, uh, you know, in your own practice. That's like the most, yeah, most beneficiary thing I feel like a young artist can do is just work for someone else. Okay. Well, you know, I, I had, um, I mean, it's a, when I was in, I went to school in Colorado, I went to Colorado College, and I had a guest professor who were teaching uh, some art thing, but it wasn't my major. I was an English and film major, but they were from Bulgaria, too. They were hilarious people. And they called America, I'll never forget it, they called it the land of the kitsch. So their impression yeah. of taste in America was, let's just say, pretty low to non-existent. Um, they thought pretty much yeah. nothing that America produced could be taken seriously. So may maybe there's a taste component to people going to Europe as well, seeing thousands of your old buildings and whatnot. Maybe that helps you be in a different frame of mind. I don't know. Of thought. course. Only art can break your heart, and only kitsch can make you rich. <laughs> Is that a thing? You know? <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's a thing. Oh, I mean, man. That was awesome. I stumbled onto it. Yeah. Cool. It's, I mean, go to art school in, in Europe, but then get your ass back to America because, like, if you want, I mean, I don't know, not to sound like some kind of person who's thought about this before, but, like, American, young American artists at this moment and for the last, you know, for as long as I can think back, like, that's where, that's where the attention is. It's, uh, I mean, it's also like, you know, America produces, uh, you know, people without socialized medicine, without, you know, free education, without free, like, post-secondary schooling, all these things. Like, Hunger. it's like, a, you have to be hungry yeah. to, like, do well in this country. And I think it creates, like, a mindset of, like, very hungry, very driven people, which is very yeah. positive. But and like, L.A. would be like the most uh, extreme version of that. I mean, I'm sure New York is the same, but oh, man, L.A. LA is. York, yeah. Whew. Yeah. And if you're not like the son or daughter of someone rich yeah. or famous, then like you got to be twice you as hungry. Brace yourself. Yeah. I get it. Okay. Yeah, next next some... quick question. Yeah. All right. Do you live to work or work to live? Um, I think, uh, you know, making art is about living like a life worth making art about or you know one without the other i don't know like you know it's just like you know as a painter like i think a lot of times like i'm kind of just holding up a uh, mirror to the world around me and like i think without the the experience and joy of living then like what the fuck would i like have to be making paintings about like without all of that it's just design yep Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Um, do you ever think about retirement? I mean, is that something like what would retirement look like to you? Or is this just, I will do this till the day I die? Uh, I'll do this, uh, um, you know, until the day I die. I think like one of the amazing benefits of being an artist is that uh, your retirement plan just looks like, you know, you getting older, you collect yourself, your entire career, and hopefully by the time you're older, like, you know, your people still value your work and the collection that you've retained of your own work is uh, is worth something. Mm. And if you have to sell off something that you made back in like '73, that's like, you know, that's that's fine because you held on to it. It's like your coin collection or something. <laughs> okay, cool. As an artist, I feel like you're just like constantly investing in yourself, and that's not for nothing. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, so this one is going to be particularly relevant to you then. What is more important, talent or effort? The big one. Uh, what's more important, talent or effort? I think, like, honestly, talent is pretty cheap, uh, especially, like, within, like, you know, painting today. Like, talent is kind of this, like, I think it's, like, you know, basically like a farce, like made up concept. Mm, okay. Like the facility to draw was like, you know, like being able to draw was just like a normal thing up until the point of the camera. Like so many of these things can just be taught and like, you can just, you know, if you pay attention, like if you work uh, hard, I think that's just like, there's so much more value in that. Mm. 
Okay. Very good. Very good. Okay. Um, are you living your dream? Yes or no? Uh, yeah. Fuck it. Sure. <laughs> cool. I like that answer. Yeah. Lebowski style. Great. Um, now, I know the pandemic has hit a lot of people hard. Have you experienced burnout yet? Or is that something that's on the radar or not at all? I uh, experienced depression for the first time in my life this Whoa. this past year. I've always been one of those like uh, ignorant motherfuckers who like when someone said that they're depressed, they'd be like, oh, well, why don't you go for a walk or like go for a hike or let's go for yeah. a bike ride and just like. Uh, I, I just knew nothing about it. I think like I was like, you know, always like so active or so focused for so long that like I never lay, really fell in to any form of depression before. But um, after having experienced it, I uh, actually I'm on, now on the other end of it. I'm doing like, I think a little bit better mentally. It's, it's really, um, uh, yeah, it's just been really in, it's been a great insight. It's been a great thing to like, you know, have a better understanding of, um, because I mean, I just didn't know a goddamn thing before. And now like, you know, it's, it's serious stuff. And, uh, there's not any piece of advice or any piece of like, you know, and I think a lot of people are, are there right now or have experienced oh, that yeah. during, Lots of people. during this. And, um, yeah, the compassion, I mean, like completely, changed the way that I feel about depression and, and you know I worked kind of while being depressed and it just made me like hate what I was working on and then mm -hmm. I don't know I yeah did anything help you did uh did anything help you to kind of come out of it a little bit or I uh you know I think like kind of broke the rules a couple times saw some friends hung out i started like yeah i just i don't really think like human beings are meant to spend this that much time alone and like i you know i think you're right yeah about that. it's it's uh i was really lucky that i didn't you know expose myself or whatever like but i just i had to see people i had to like you know get out of the kind of like little dusty crawl space of my brain <laughs> right yeah. I feel that. I feel that very strongly. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, here's here's something that I like to ask. What is something that you believe that almost nobody else believes? <sighs> I uh, I don't know if I really believe in anything. Through an island. To be honest. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, like, I mean, I I wouldn't go as far as to say that I'm a nihilist, but I I'm joking. I think like like believing in something is like such an insane luxury of of I mean, like you have to ignore so much to believe in something and like and it's and like the you know the the the, the whole form, the purest form of like belief in my mind is just like you know, the acceptance of one's own ignorance and like, you know, I, I don't know that I like, I don't know what to believe in. Uh, <laughs> like I really, I, I really uh, admire people who believe in stuff and like there's a lot of people believe in some crazy shit and it just sounds so nice, yeah. you know, to be able to believe in something. Um, and then to believe in something that other people don't believe in uh kind of believe the moon landing was fake okay all right a lot of but people like, agree but, but that's interesting okay you, you you dig your feet in on the moon landing i get it <laughs> okay cool <laughs> I, I don't know but that's the thing is like but you have a you have a doubt okay yeah like i i just like conspiracy theories yeah. and that one is one that like really upsets older people so it's like kind of a fun one um yeah, I don't know. Believing in stuff, it, it sounds really nice and healthy. Okay. So we've only got uh, one or two more here. We're wrapping up. Thank you so much right. for your time, and it's, it's all been wonderful so far. Um, of so who do, you, who do you admire the most? Who do you look at and you say, they've got it what I want. They've, they're doing it exactly right. If I had what they had, I, I'd be there. 
Interesting. You know, like I really, um, there are a lot of super, super successful artists that I just like don't think are that happy. And I just like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think fucking David Hockney seems really happy. David Hockney, like, you know, just like this old, weird little man now living in the UK, like moved back to the UK, uh, I think. I don't know. I think I heard rumors that he moved back there so that he could smoke outside because it became too difficult to smoke smoke cigarettes. Uh, it's in always the little things, isn't it? But this guy is like, you know, what he's afforded himself, like, David Hockney can make amazing paintings, but he's, I feel like he's gone out of his way to make ugly paintings or I guess like, you know, to explore things within image making that have resulted in ugly paintings. But through the exploration, like the work seems like worthy and like to have like a greater like like value than if he had just like made pretty pictures his whole life. He still makes amazing pretty pictures, but he's also done things that just like have produced ugly pictures, yeah. but through, like for the right reasons, you know, challenging himself. And like, I think as like an artist and, you know, with this idea of like getting older and like continuing to make things like the curiosity and like preserving one's curiosity and then also uh, continuing to challenge yourself and also challenging, you know, others and their like beliefs and, and things or ways of working or like, you know, a hierarchy of, of whatever. Like, I think it's amazing. Like, you know, he's like fucking ancient drawing on his iPad, like printing out his little iPad drawings, drawing on the phone, making mm -hmm. like, you know, crayon drawings. Some of them hideous, but just like he just does it. And uh, I think there's something pretty, pretty uh, inspiring about that. Is that the path to happiness? If not one sentence, what is the path to happiness? Final thought. I think the path to happiness is retaining curiosity. That's, we'll stop. that's it. I think curious people, you know, continue to live every day with like a reason to, to live. And, um, yeah, that's, that's an important thing for me. All right, I great, believe man. in curiosity. There you go. I All like right. that. That's yeah, a good I way to wrap it up. Um, yeah. and you know, just the last little detail, where can people follow you or support you? Um, I'll put some uh, links yeah, in the like, episode details, but maybe just give a quick shout out to yourself. Yeah. Um, you can follow me on Instagram, Canyon underscore castator. Uh, and then, I don't know, check out the, the show. It'll probably happen in real life in August, hopefully. Yep. Yep. I mean, Sweden, everyone's just like roaming around on the street yeah, they, anyways. Like, maybe they were right. Who knows? Maybe they had it right yeah, all along. Yeah, who fucking knows? Um, yeah, so, you know, I'll eventually post the work from that show, like once it's open and all that. So, yeah, just follow me on Instagram. And then follow the studio project, uh, Mulhalif Studios on Instagram. I post like, you know, the artists that are in the building and the things that they have going on, exhibitions and interviews and all that. So Sounds awesome, cool my friend. Well, I will well, put all you. of those links in there. So thank you so much for taking the time. Fascinating story. I'm impressed. I love what you're doing, man. I think it's very cool. Maybe not cool to you, but... For those of us watching on the outside, I think it's cool, and I think you're doing a great job. So you know, keep keep kicking ass, and uh, you know, I know you will keep doing what you're doing, man. <laughs> and uh, with, thank you uh, for having me on. Um, my pleasure. I hope you do many more podcasts in the future. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, with I do. That, Should I do more of these? Yeah, I mean, hey. ready for Rogan. Let's go. Yeah, JRE. Yeah, uh, man. How many has he done? But with that podcast officially. Over. Thanks for listening to the Beat the Often Path podcast. If you've been enjoying this show, please like, comment, share, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, subscribe to me on YouTube. It would mean the world to me. Also, do you have an unusual success story or do you know someone who does? Well, please recommend them to me. They could be a future guest on this show. Maybe they've rolled the largest boulder down the mountains of Tibet. Or maybe they built the world's largest chicken farm in Madagascar. The point is, I don't know what I don't know. So I'm looking for inspiration and unusual success stories. 
So help me by being a part of this adventure. I'm looking to grow this podcast with you. Thanks again for listening.